Dr. Tan Wu Meng. Question number three, please. Climate change is an existential challenge for Singapore. In uh, March my, my 20... apologies, Minister. Are you taking yes. uh, three to five together? Yes. Uh, thank you for the reminder. It, it's, uh, uh, my, my humble apologies. I know this is the no, second no, time you've reminded all. me in two days. Not, not at all. So it's a combined response to questions three to five? Yes, yes. All I right. was, uh, you know, vacillating between, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, sustainable jobs now to sustainable energy. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, completely understandable. Yeah. So I'll be taking, uh, may I have your permission to take question three to five? Please do. Yeah. Okay. And I hope to sustain myself through the rest of the <laughs> questions as well. <laughs> Climate change is an existential challenge for Singapore. In March 2020, Singapore submitted our enhanced 2030 nationally determined contributions and long-term low emissions development strategy, or LEDS. One of our key thrusts under the LEDS is to adopt advanced low carbon technologies, such as carbon capture, carbon utilization and storage, or CCUS for short, and low carbon hydrogen to decarbonize our economy. For CCUS, a small number of pathways are at the technologically advanced stage, but it requires further development for it to be commercially viable in Singapore. A key pathway is carbon capture and storage, or CCS. We are seeing more large-scale projects being developed with government support internationally. This includes Project Longship and Porthos in Norway and the Netherlands, respectively. However, Singapore faces challenges in deploying CCS domestically, including a lack of any known geological formation, formations that are suitable for the permanent storage of carbon dioxide underground. We are therefore exploring partnerships with companies and other countries with suitable geological formations to enable carbon dioxide storage opportunities. We are also exploring carbon capture and utilisation pathways where carbon dioxide is captured and converted into waste-based feedstocks or natural minerals that can be used to produce aggregates for reclamation or for the built environment in the form of building materials. There are a number of companies developing test pits for use in Singapore and examples of commercial scale operations in other countries. Captured carbon dioxide may also be used to manufacture synthetic fuels and chemicals such as kerosene and methanol, which can be used as aviation and marine fuels. However, most pathways for synthesizing fuels or chemicals from carbon dioxide are not mature and they are relatively nascent. Though some are at demonstration or post-demonstration stage, they can be quite expensive compared to conventional production and while others remain at scale that are still sort of within the lab itself, so it's still at lab scale. Some also require significant amounts of energy in the form of low carbon hydrogen, which would take some time to become cost competitive with other conventional sources of energy. Low carbon hydrogen is a key technology for Singapore to decarbonize. A recent feasibility study commissioned by government agencies and published in June this year concluded that hydrogen has the potential to decarbonize maritime, electricity generation, heavy transportation and some industrial process. However, until CCUS is commercially viable, Singapore cannot produce low carbon hydrogen at scale. Hence, we are exploring a range of other supply pathways. The key challenge with scaling up the supply of hydrogen is the very high storage and transportation costs. Hydrogen, as most of you would know, in fact, as all of you would know, is a gas with a boiling point which is far lower than natural gas. It is therefore a significant engineering challenge to transport 
and to store hydrogen in a commercially viable manner. So to overcome this problem, the industry is working on different hydrogen carriers, each with their advantages, but also with their challenges to overcome. These transportation options include ammonia. While supply chains exist today for ammonia, but ammonia is currently not produced using low carbon methods or shipped in quantities required of an energy carrier. Burning ammonia also releases noxious oxides. So to avoid this, we need to first liberate hydrogen in ammonia, which again would require a lot of in, you know, intensive energies. So it's, it's by itself an, an energy intensive process. Liquid organic hydride carriers or the LOHCs, which allows storage and transport of hydrogen at ambient conditions are less hydrogen dense, but this means a relatively higher cargo footprint would be needed to import the same amount of hydrogen. And the process required to release hydrogen from these LOHCs itself can also be land and energy intensive. Now the third form, liquefied hydrogen, where hydrogen is transported in its natural form. The process to liquefy hydrogen itself for transport is again very energy intensive and the technology for the large scale shipping of liquefied hydrogen is relatively nascent today. So there is currently no global consensus on which carrier form of hydrogen which might dominate in the future or when long distance transport of hydrogen and the processes to liberate hydrogen from carriers might become viable. We are keen, Singapore is keen to realise the decarbonisation potential of hydrogen and to develop into a regional hydrogen hub. Government agencies will continue to monitor the technological and market developments to ensure that Singapore maintains its competitiveness. Additionally, we will continue to collaborate with companies and the research community on research development and demonstration, these RD&D projects, and test bits for CCUS solutions as well as low carbon hydrogen. Last year, we launched a 49 million Singapore dollars low carbon energy research or LCER funding initiative for the next five years to improve the technical and the economic feasibility of low carbon technologies. At the same time, we are also collaborating with international partners to further, development, to further the development of low carbon technologies, both in the RD&D and the development of supply chains. We have signed an MOU with Australia on cooperation in low emission solution and an MOU with Chile on low carbon hydrogen collaboration. And we just signed an arrangement regarding collaboration on low carbon hydrogen with New Zealand as well. We look forward to more partnerships and to leveraging them to capture new opportunities from emerging technologies. Dr. Tan Wu Meng also asked specifically about the industry transformation map of the marine and offshore engineering sector. Agencies are updating the ITM to take into account the impact of COVID-19 and the implications of a low carbon transition and we target to launch a refreshed ITM next year. We expect offshore renewables and offshore carrier transport of hydrogen to be among the areas of opportunity, of opportunity in the refreshed ITM. Thank you. Dr. Tan Wu Ming. I thank the Minister for his sustained uh, exposition on the topic. And if I may sustain a couple of supplementary questions as well on this issue. Uh, let me start first by declaring that I am an advisor 
to the Shipbuilding and Marine Engineering Employees Union. And my supplementary questions are as follows. On the first uh, point, the minister spoke about how there are currently significant constraints regarding the deployment of clean hydrogen and its transport. Some of these constraints appear to be specific to the origin as well as the destination, the liquefaction and then the subsequent gasification at the destination. But however, I would like to ask the minister whether he sees at some point opportunities arising further in the transport of liquid hydrogen. I understand that there are some prototype developments uh, from, the, from the Japanese in this sector. And even as we explore opportunities for the offshore and marine engineering sector, I wonder if the ministry is looking at ways to keep our industry ready in the event that some of these new modalities and technologies start to become commercially viable. Secondly, I would also like to ask the minister in terms of the changing environment regarding sustainability practices around the world, we see a situation where sustainability is increasingly a criterion for access to markets. And how are these developments he's outlined will maintain Singapore's competitiveness and access to markets around the world. Thank you very much. Sir, I thank the Honourable Member, Dr Tan, for his uh, questions. With regards to the um, opportunities arising from the transport of hydrogen, certainly we do not uh, rest on our, on our laurels. I think for us, um, if anything at all, um, given how we have gone through the last um, many decade, decades, first um, as, as a petrochem sort of oil and gas centre, uh, centre of excellence for the last uh, five decades plus, I think as we pivot into sustainable fuels, into a low carbon emission strategy itself, we envisage that um, our strategic hub status. We will continue to pivot. We will continue to leverage on what we've built thus far to become the crossroads. Once um, the transportation of liquid hydrogen, um, or even for that matter, um, even in the in the in the um, trading of electrons, uh, electricity, we can envisage that um, it is one market that we think that we can uh, leverage and become the hub in this entire region itself. Certainly one of those um, initiatives that we are driving and we are actively looking. Now today, quite a number of technologies are quite nascent, even though they hold a lot of promise. There is option value in exploring and studying which is the likely um, drive or which is the likely initiative that's going to give us maximum benefit and maximum economic value. So it's one of those um, things where we looked at the myriad of opportunities that's available, the research and development, and we are plugged in um, to many of these research initiatives. And once we are able to land and the vision gets clearer in terms of, of where each one of these technologies is moving, I think we will be able to leverage and, and extract the, 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 um, you know, the, the synergies that we can, uh, we can actually sort of um, um, help move us ahead. Now, with regards to the changing environment and the access to markets, if you look at where we are, how we're pivoting our entire oil and gas, we're looking at more sustainable uh, development in terms of the fuels that we are. And two big companies have come and invested in, in our country. One of them is Nesti and the other one is uh, Arkemir. We're now looking at the production of uh, sustainable aviation fuels as well. Although, again, the technology is relatively nascent, it, it costs a lot more to pivot from existing um, fuels and natural gases to go into sustainable aviation fuel. But 
it is one of those things that we cannot ignore as well. So there are separate initiatives that drive that part of it. With regards to um, hydrogen today, it is very difficult and it's very, very expensive for us to, and it's not very productive, not very efficient for us to produce green hydrogen, which is the, the cleanest form of hydrogen in Singapore, because we are geographically disadvantaged. We would need renewable energy to produce this uh, hydrogen here locally. Hence, we decided to adopt a strategy where we looked at blue hydrogen, which is a low carbon form of hydrogen, and how we can import it, and how we can then look at liberating that hydrogen from here. So these are various initiatives that we are looking at. And I take um, Dr. Tan's point to heart. We will not rest on our laurel. We will actively seek out the best, the most cost-effective way, whilst taking into consideration our NDC commitment targets to establish ourselves as a hub in this region. Thank you. Mr. Lewis Ng. Thank you, sir. Could I just ask, with this new exciting developments in hydrogen in CCUS, uh, if they do become feasible, uh, whether we are also then reviewing our projections on when we can reach net zero emissions. So if hydrogen CCUS becomes feasible, maybe can we reach net zero by 2050? Thank you. Well, I thank uh, the Honourable MP, uh, Ms. Linton, for his uh, very thought-provoking question. Today, uh, our plan is to half the emission by 2050 and to reach carbon neutrality or zero sometime in the second half of this century. Uh, we have every intention of um, reaching that target within the second half of this century. Of course, if we're able to bring it forward, um, that would be really an added bonus. And of course, it's something that we always will aspire to do. Thank you. Associate Professor James Lim. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank Minister Tan. I just wonder if I could follow up. He mentioned that uh, one of the important objectives is demonstration projects. And we know that one element of demonstration projects that has been rolled out in many countries uh, around the world is hydrogen in the form of public transportation, especially buses and taxi cabs. Um, I'm keenly aware of the negative demonstration example of uh, cases like the Hindenburg, but I wonder if, uh, especially when we are looking uh, to transition our fleet uh, beyond just electricity uh, to a low carbon future, whether this will be part of the push uh, in terms of our public transportation. Thank you. I thank um, Professor Lim for his uh, question. We are looking at a couple of projects. I think currently um, there is a um, just let me just check on it. Yes. There is a low carbon energy research funding initiative, which is a multi agency initiative involving ASTAR, EDB, uh, the Energy Market Authority, as well as the National Climate Change Secretariat and the NRF, which is the National Research Foundation. I think this I mentioned earlier in my speech, uh, in, my, uh, in my reply um, to, to Dr. Tan's uh, PQs. It is co-driven by EDB and EMA, uh, with ASTAR as the implementing agency on behalf of the, uh, of the government. Now, I think in terms of the, um, on a limited basis, it's something that we could potentially look at, um, depending on, on the, the proposals that come in. Uh, but one of the, the key things that we are actively pursuing um, is looking at imports. The renewable energy, uh, I mean, we are looking at imports from the ASEAN countries and where we think that the countries that have uh, maximum geographical advantage in terms of producing renewable energy with very low carbon or zero carbon, those are the, the, the immediate short-term uh, measures that we will be moving forward 
to reduce our carbon footprint. Thank you.